Yeah, we're going to um, be talking to Drew C. Bellman about the classes, um, the art classes you're teaching. You're teaching at both the Fromm Institute and Osher Lifelong Learning, right? Yeah, very different courses, very different classes. It's sort of neck breaking. On Tuesday, I'll have to have one hat. And then on Thursday, it's a whole other thing. It's a it's going to be actually a lot of fun. Cool. Yeah. Well, I, I like lots of different things. Yeah. So um, why don't you bring up your presentation? Let's start talking about this art that you're going to be discussing in your classes. Wait, hang on a second. What the heck did I do with it? Oh, it's here. Uh, let me go back to the beginning. Hang on a second. I'm sorry. You're seeing where the sausages are made. Well, the, the behind the scenes, inside baseball here. Yeah. <laughs> wait a second. Uh, presentation. Sorry about that. Here. Hey, there we go. Awesome. Nice. Um, so I okay. So I am teaching. Um ah, hold on. I need to just uh get to there. I don't know why I can't see my um comments. It's okay. You'll tell me about who's asking questions in the yeah, chat. Yeah, I'm going to be monitoring chat. Really encourage folks to make comments, ask questions. We always want these things to be interactive. Phenomenal. Okay, so <clears throat> I'm really uh, the first class I I uh, I taught uh, a couple of years ago was the Bay Area Figurative Movement, which is a really wonderful time in Bay Area art. It's like the first time they really have. California had had its own thing, its own movement made of ideas that uh, that came homegrown. And, and we'll talk more about, but it, it really a reaction to a sort of overconfident or maybe deservedly con confident East Coast, which sort of declared what art would be in America. <clears throat> and so the story of the Bay Area figurative movement is about how uh, these California artists broke free of what they were supposed to be doing or what was valued and came up with something different. And, but I mean, there's definitely an abstract element to it, but it's, it's figurative and it's quite beautiful. And um, we'll talk about a little bit about that. The second half, uh, a new class that I'm just starting um, this Thursday at the From, which is at, um, you know, USF um, is art, the art of wow, which is something I made up. It's something that I've thought about for a lot of years, which is sometimes you, you walk, you, you go to a piece of artwork, you're, you're standing in front of it and you just go, wow, oh. you just, something really fears your consciousness about it. And I thought a lot about what that meant and what artwork that uh, pertained to. And some of it is about the scale, the, the giant, some of, some of them are just giant pieces. Um, it didn't start out to be uh, technology uh, based, but then sort of more recently it has been. But I just look at the roots of that, where it started uh, and then where it is now and where you can go and see some of it. So that's that's the class that I will be teaching at the From starting Thursday. But so just to begin, um, we'll, shall we do a little bit of uh, the Bay Area figurative? I thought I would do four or five slides of that and then yeah. move on to the other class. Yeah, that sounds good. And I'm really glad you're bringing up the um, Institute of Art because is I believe there's some news uh, this week about this, yeah. right? Uh, Lorene Jobs has started a fund to try to buy it. I mean, she could buy it without a fund, but let's not even <laughs> talk about that. <laughs> she's very involved in the art world and she's very involved. Lorene, uh, Steve Jobs' widow, is very involved in, in funding art. Um, she has an enormous collection of art. Um, and so, does anyone know about what happened? The California School of Fine Arts was a center of, it was center the, the art school uh, for, I don't know, 50 years, sort of from the 1930s. Uh, it had a 
reinvention um, post-war. And that's the period that I talk about because those the post-war uh, California School of Fine Arts was a place where all of these people came um, who, after the war and they had the GI Bill, which allowed them to, uh, to be their college to be, their education would be paid for by the government. And so a lot of people came back and, and imagine they had a free education and they chose to be, they were either, either artists beforehand or it was something they wanted to do. And it became a really thriving, vibrant community there. And it's also very well known for the huge um, mural inside, which is by Diego Rivera. And um, it's just a kind of an amazing place. And if you think like crazy people went there, like Jerry Garcia, and um, there are so many people. Oh, in um, our I'll mention one, Dave Getz, the drummer for Big Brother and the Holding Company went That's there. That's great, yeah. But it's, if you, um, I, I should drop the list. It's, it's been amazing what that, um, what it has wrought. And uh, but what happened was that over COVID, it, it had what had a, a it was changed. The name was changed to San Francisco Institute of Art. And that's how people in San Francisco know it now. Um, but in any case, the enrollment went down and they were unable to get if they would have been able to rescue it if it weren't for COVID, which was completely shut down and they ran out of money and they closed. And it's just an incredible thing that San Francisco allowed it to close because it is a legendary place. So if you want, I have I have a bunch of stories, I mean, sorry, articles that have been written about why they couldn't save it. It's just, it's an interesting thing. And anyway, this week, as Rodney said, um, Lorene Jobs has started a fund to try to buy it because it just seems impossible that they won't try to revive it. Yeah, but, in, that, in that mural, it's it, that's a very important part of San Francisco cultural heritage. And you know, we need, the public needs to have access to that mural. I think the guy, um, George, George Lucas, he offered to buy it for $50 million, but it turns out the land is owned by Berkeley. It's like a very odd convoluted thing of who owns what parts of it. So it's interesting to look up, um, but it will go back to the, the uh, Bay Area figuratives. So there were, after the war, there were all of these people who came and David Park was a professor, Elmer Bischoff. I'm just going to throw out the names because they become important players. And uh, am I going to, okay. So after the war, the, the most important thing that happened in American art is abstract expressionism. And I, I'm, I don't know how many of you know Jackson Pollock or Willem de Kooning or Clifford Still, but these, among others, they took the angst and anxiety of World War II, post-World War II, all of the, you know, we were just, you know, engulfed in that war. And afterwards, art started to be no longer include the figure. And they were doing this abstract work that was very physical, a lot of you know, movement and, and action in the work. And that in California, they um, they were also doing, they were all, everyone in, in America, it had become the first time that America had had its own um, artistic movement and took it, took that title away from Paris as a center of the art world in the world. So that was, you know, Jackson Pollock was in the cover of time of Life magazine in 1947, and he was heralded the best thing that has happened um, to art. So in California, David Park, he and Elmer Bischoff, the, the professors at the school, they were also doing abstract work. And this Clifford Still here, uh, over here, um, he was a very, very strict abstract artist and he was one of what they call the uh, color field painters and um he and david park did not get along and david park uh he didn't feel right doing the abstract it didn't sit with him and it's i've thought a lot about it and i've read a lot about it obviously but there's something about california it's sunny and people are you know knowing having come from the east coast people are just happier brighter more um just easier to be around the 
nobody's in a bad mood here. Whereas I grew up with people in bad moods everywhere in New York, grumpy about <laughs> the subway and grumpy about the bus. And this is why we moved here, Drusy. Of course. And but so what's interesting is David Park just said everybody was doing abstract and he had a whole a whole his whole body of work was abstract. And he just one day went to the Berkeley dump and he and his wife Dee Dee threw all of his work into the dump and threw it away. Yeah. And he went back home, back to his studio, and he started again. He literally started again in a style that he was comfortable with. And what was interesting about it was that it was, yeah, this was the first work that came out. It's called Kids on, a, on Bikes. It was 1950. So 1949, he threw his work away. In 1950, he entered this work into a competition in the Bay Area, and um, it's it won the competition. It was like this considered this very fresh uh, um, novel. I mean, people didn't realize that they wanted the figure. Didn't, they didn't want all abstract. People want a little of different things, and they looked at this. And if you think about it, if you look at this, maybe someone here. Uh, in our group could tell me what about this makes it figurative and what about this painting also still keeps an abstract sense yeah because it's not it's not like a realistic depiction of first of all like like you look at it you say where is that bicyclist right. um, it's almost like he's hovering in the air and then the kind of relationship between him and the boy um, you know, kids on bikes, but it's kind of almost like bike on kid, you know. <laughs> um, I want I definitely want to invite folks to um, throw um, thoughts in the chat or to uh, unmute. You're perfectly welcome to do that. Um, but we'd love to hear your thoughts on, um, you know, is this like what elements of it do you find abstract? That reminds me about that guy is uh, driving the bicycle, Rodney. Uh-huh. Well, that's. That's I, I, I it kind of warms my heart because that's my favorite activity. <laughs> what do you think about the stripes on his shirt? How does that sit with you? Yeah, it's not entirely realistic, but it still looks cool. It looks like um, kind of a neat, it's almost like he's wearing an abstract uh, garment or something. It's like they're jumping off of him. Oh, Gail would like you to define what is figurative Absolutely. art. Oh, okay. Figurative art is uh, it, it's image image that is recognizable as something that you would um, be able to label or know, like a boy, a bike. Um, you know, uh, still lives are figurative. You immediately say that's a that's a vase, and that those are flowers. You know that that's what a um, figurative art is. It it obviously it it's the figure that you're recognizing like we have that but then like where like yeah where is this you know right that's what's that's what's abstract i i, re I really don't understand where the bicyclist is um where the boy is why there's like this kind of gold yellow background i think he's in a circus or something like that or a carnival and you know it's funny you mentioned the stripes because i noticed the stripes right away because i love all those old, all the old TV shows and stuff way back uh, before then. The classic thing was to see a boy in the striped T-shirt. They're so that's so classic, and I just love images of that. And I remember my own boys in their little striped T-shirts. And anyhow, but anyhow, about the um, about the piece of art we're looking at, um, you know, the the boy is so normal, you know, kid on a bike with a striped T-shirt, and then the guy. The guy looks so strange to me. Like the size of that bike is looks like it's got a huge back wheel, and he looks like he's a performer. And I think he's like in a from a carnival or a circus or something, you know. And and I don't see how the two are put together in this piece of work here. Like what that means, but that's well, the maybe, impression I got. I mean, could it be like the boy is at a circus or something and he's he's like watching this yeah because he's on a bike too right those are the handlebars yes yeah oh, didn't even didn't realize that 
Um, comment from Karen, the red tricks your eye to go through the painting. So the red is kind of leading us um, into the center of the painting, I think is what Karen's saying. And then Gail says, red arcs, strips on shirt, the boy's lips, the wheels on the bike in the distance, correlation between desperate objects. The artist wants us to see this. Great comment from Gail. Also, I'd point out, um, the thing about this is that it is a combination. It's not, he doesn't care about perspective or size. The boy is in the forefront and the guy is in the distance. The guy on the bike is in the distance, but as, as someone said, the wheel is so large that it's kind of a mishmash of, you know, he's thrown reality out the window, which is a characteristic of expressionist work or abstract work. And you can see on the far right, it's sort of, I don't know if it's bushes or the white um, sort of railing, I guess. But so they're just, if you, if you think about all of the elements which don't make sense, that I would put in sort of the abstract column of, of this work. But at the same time, there are recognizable figures. So it really is kind of a cross. What, what about the idea that there's some surrealism here, that this is almost a dreamlike image? What do you think of that, Drusy? I do, I do think that. I think that that's sort of a bit left over. Is there sort of the crossover with um, a lot of, of the original abstract art uh, that came from Europe after the war, those a lot of those artists were surrealists who came and lived in New York and that kind of language and um, those ideas were adopted. So you know psychology and 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 um, just not really caring think thinking about dreams, thinking about um, images that don't necessarily have to make sense. Um, and I think you see a lot of that in this. And that's the thing about David Park. He didn't toss everything out. He kept elements of, you know, freer thinking and not having to keep, draw be between the lines, you know, inside the lines. He, he, he kept a lot of those um, elements of kind of freedom um, for the artist, but added, you know, kept, but, but did it with a figure. Um, some some other comments, Drusy. Um, Jennifer, our our amazing tech uh, moderator, says uh, she just says backstage question mark. Is it possibly um, you know out of circus and seeing like I don't know maybe the boy's about to go out on stage or something. Um, and then Gail says the reel on the left side of the white railing in the abstract on the right side of the railing to me portrays two worlds: left side comforting. And right side, scary, unknown. Yeah, this we kind of like what's going on on the right side? Could that be an audience, maybe? Oh, maybe. You know what? I think you're right. I see that. I haven't thought that. The one thing I can, I, I've always thought is that he's taken his fingernail and run it through the paint and left it very unfinished. Do you see those lines? If you see Wait, this why don't you put them out here? Okay. Oh, yeah. That's from his fingernail, huh? Yeah, but I see this could be a face in the audience. Yeah, I kind of, that's what I was kind of getting. But he's not attentive to details. Well, let's move on. And that way we'll get to both classes. Um, so that's, that I think this, this, it's a very small painting. It's little, um, but it was very surprising when he did this and nobody else was doing it. It wasn't for two years that someone joined him. Um, so these are, are works that followed uh, David Park. There he is again, he did figures and this is a woman reading, um, we know tea, with a teapot, very much like, um, you know, a very mundane everyday uh, figure uh, painting. But the way he does it is so, it's like messy. He's, he's, he's painted with colors that don't necessarily match what you'd think they be, but he does not care. He is, he's like painting the figure and figuring the fi figuring it out through the paintbrush. It's not carefully drawn. It's, you can see like on that forearm with a little white paint to add the light. He's, um, I can point it out here. This is not smooth. It's extremely thick and it's choppy. 
and you definitely get the idea. Is it exacting? No. Over here with the, you know, when I paint, I would smooth this over, but he, that is not part of it. It's all very much, he's painting the figure with an expressionist sense of feeling his way through it. That's how I see it. Does anyone have any other, and we can go through the rest of these, but that specific David Park sort of follows from the kids on a, on bikes. Well, that's uh, kind of like what I like about your style, Drucy, is that, you know, I've, I've seen David Park and I've kind of contemplated him, but I've never really thought about, well, why is he doing it this way? What's going on in the art world that he's maybe um, in conversation with? And, and never really thought that the abstract expressionist would be influencing him in that way, that you would end up with kind of that rough um, kind of color field look to these, you know, these scenes that he's setting. So so it, is, it really does help explain um, kind of where David Park fits in. Yeah, well, the second person um, right here, uh, Elmer Bischoff, who was a professor at the... Um, California School of Fine Arts with Park, and they were very close. Um, he did this this painting, uh, Girl in the Orange Sweater, um, is at SF MoMA. And it's a, just, if you can go and see it, I don't even know if it's in the gallery though. I'd have to check if it's being seen, but you could even look it up on SF MoMA's website and see it large. It is a masterpiece. And when I first saw it, I was like, what is going on here? What, where is she? Is it a woman? Is it a, and who's that behind here in the yellow? I did not get it. And I didn't give it much thought or time. And then when I was researching Elmer Bischoff, I have grown to love this painting. So there is something about that splash of color that is just riveting. And nothing here is distinct. You sort of get a sense that she's either in a library or a cafeteria, you don't know. Um, it all sort of allows your imagination to fill in what you don't get from the specifics. Does anyone else have any comments about? Uh, well, I will tell you, I believe, according to the SF MoMA website, it is on display on the second floor. Nice. Which, by the way, everybody can go on to, to the second floor of SF MoMA for free right now. Right now, today. You go. You, you do have to get a ticket, but you just tell them, I only want to see the second floor, and then it's free. Great. Well, Elmer Bischoff, that is in, um, that SF moment you could see, you know, today. But then we'll go down here to Diebenkorn. Does anyone here not know Diebenkorn, Richard Diebenkorn? I think I think our, our, my audience, we're likely to all know him. Okay. So I guess my feeling is, you know, in the, on the East Coast, when I was there working in galleries and museums for a lot of years, um, people would not, on the East Coast, would not know these artists. They just wouldn't. They were California artists. They just, the only one who really broke through would be Richard Diebenkorn. And in some cases, maybe Wayne Thibault. But Diebenkorn is actually a complete worldwide um, breakthrough artist from California. But for the most part, people there would definitely not know Bischoff, David Park, Joan Brown over here who came later. She was um, a student of Elmer Bischoff's. And she, I don't know if anyone saw the show at SF MoMA, the Joan mm -hmm. Brown show. We did two two programs about it. Okay, so you know that she, I mean, she was just brilliant and full of humor. And, you know, she's also an example of someone who is doesn't care about the specifics. You see, he, she sort of painted her way through this dog. And in the background, nothing is exact. It's much like the Bischoff and the park. This is all, uh, this is all Bay Area figurative. They put figurative combining it with abstract and they found their own sort of midway or part way. Um, and later on, I, as you know, Joan um, Brown leaves this style and does something much more um, of a diary of her life that's very clear and shiny and it's a different thing but initially this is what she was painting and this is what made her famous yeah, it's interesting her trajectory because you, know, you talk about abstract and in, in the first paintings of her exhibition were were abstract yeah abstract and then she this is kind of this middle period 
and then you're right. She has this later period where where it's very there's like a very, real strong narrative that you get from all of her paintings. And so um, Wayne Thibault, this is not you know this isn't really what he's known for, but he uh, he did desserts. Um, I mean he's so he's beloved in our area here, and um, most people I imagine that you you all would know him because he's you know you you've done a lot of these programs and you you've gone to to see work but people really know him as cakes um but when he lived um he lived in Sacramento by Sacramento by the deltas he painted these phenomenal he also has painted a lot of San Francisco scenes that are also there's something very painterly abstract these um uh, fields of um, either, I don't think they're grapes, I think they're olive, olive trees, but um, he is involved with the pattern they make rather than the fact of them. And the pattern that the, the land it makes in as people are using it to create um, products that we need. And it just is just a very beautiful sort of everything he makes I think of as delicious. But this is another example of something that's figurative, but these trees are so beautiful. Yeah, uh, Sarah's pointing out that um, one of his paintings is on the uh, cover of one of the most recent. Yes, books. I saw that and I thought, that looks like Wayne Thibault. And I thought, but how could it? He died a couple of years ago. They dug they, it up from somewhere. I've never seen that painting. They do that. They have this, this archive of works. It's so exciting because you get to see something new from an artist you know can't create work anymore. It was like thrilling. Um, and then the last one here, James Week, uh, sorry, Paul Weeks. What is it? Say? Yeah, Paul Weeks. He um, he did a lot of uh, sort of landscape, rough and um, uh, it's landscape, but if you look at it and you really kind of step away from it. It could be an abstract painting. I mean, we know it's a landscape, but it's very much amorphous forms. And again, using the brush stroke in an inexact way. Um, in every one of these pieces, I'm sure that you can see the abstract part of it, but also predominantly figurative. It's giving you an idea of something um, and then we can fill in the rest. It's also very much on the viewer to say, this is what it's making me think, and this is what it's making me feel. And it doesn't matter if you're wrong. What it, what it mattered is that it spoke to you in some way. Yeah, both, both the Weeks and the Tebow images, um, to me, evoke California, um, runs a seascape, looks to me very much like a Pacific seascape. And then Tebow very much makes me think of... Uh, the the uh, the delta you know the area around Sacramento where he where he lived yeah so that is the Bay Area figurative um, let me see I don't know in the interest of time I want to make sure are we ready to go back to are we ready to go to the art art that wows or do we want to talk a little bit more does anyone have anything else to say before oh, well, I'll, I'll just ask you um, Drusi I'm always interested like you know you're going to represent these artists. And they have a pretty large body of work. How do you how do you decide which ones of the paintings you want to in, to use in your class? That's a good question. It's difficult because um, the class I did last year from was eight weeks, so I was able to do really stretch it out. And I did um, David Park, uh, Elmer Bischoff, and and um, Richard Devencorn all had their own, his own class. So I would did two hours on each of those artists. There was so much to say, and there's so much about the movement, but then the movement started to go in different directions. So um, uh, Theophilus Brown and Paul Warner are a couple of, they call them bridge generation, sort of the movement, uh, the Bay Area figured movement went in different directions so that some of it became very purely figurative and others kept that sort of loose painterly style with lots of paint and um and you know they sort of all went through their own part of it but every one of them was was using the figure whether or not it was 
you know, loosely done or, or um, Paul Warner, if you look his work, look at his work, his is, is meticulously done. Um, and his uh, partner in life, um, Theophilus Brown, he, he also has sort of fantastical figures, but it's very bright colors, but it's figurative art done in a sort of um, unexpected way in all of these, the, each artist has his or her own style and it's, it's pretty great. I, I, there are a lot of artists to choose from. And to be honest, I think I choose the ones who made an impact in some way. And um, uh, maybe that the imagery I felt um, uh, spoke, spoke to the movement as well as, uh, I mean, it's all kind of wonderful. And uh, I, I, I can find something wonderful in each artist, but in the interest of the, um, of the class having eight sessions, I did Joan Brown, which got into the funk movement, you know, as it moved away from the uh, David Park going to the, the, the Berkeley dump, we got, it became more of other things. There's a bridge generation and a second generation. Um, and so it, you know, as any movement, it sort of, um, it, it fizzled out and became other things. Pop art came into play and, um, and a lot of the art sort of became other things, but this is the core of it. And that's yes. how I. Yeah. It sounds like you, you often look for pieces that are kind of um, going to be a departure or, or kind of like a stepping stone to something else. And in, in that you you really want to um, trace the trajectory of a career. You Actually, know. I also have to say that something that um, part of being a docent also, I I really find, you know, having met a lot of people in the museum who were just visiting it, they, they don't do art in their life. They don't, they don't think that much about it. They were visiting either as tourists or as a, you know, once in a long time thing. And so I feel that the art, that art needs to be approachable and have a story. You know, I mean, that's what I love about it. I love that we can talk about Joan Brown and her fascinating life and her marriage to Manuel Neary and how she gave up commercial success in favor of many, many different, you know, they're just each, each one of these artists has a, a great story and, and personal interest in it reflecting in the work. There should be a whole picture. We shouldn't be talking about, I mean, for me, I find it's not fun to talk about it in terms of like the technical aspects of it. I think people are interested in the life story and what, how it's how it manifests in the work. Yep, yep. We want to know, you know, it, it, we, we always are drawn to narrative. <laughs> Definitely. So let me move on to the art that wows because it's a whole nother, I mean, it's it's kind of head spinning how different it is. Okay, so this is Robert Smithson's Spiral Jetty. And I think that's supposed to say 1979. I don't know why it just says 19. Um, so, uh, okay, art that wows. It is a, um, the kind of thing that I think I, I explained it that uh, the art had gotten to be very commercial. Um, uh, people in the 50, you know, 40s and 50s, like Jackson Pollock, everything was in the gallery, the Leo Castelli gallery, the Gertrude Stein gallery. People were, the art was becoming a lot about uh, what it was selling for and what you, what price you could get and, and, a whole, and collectors. And that became a big thing. And it was making a huge shift, a, like a seismic shift, um, how America Americans were greeting art. It got kind of it got extremely competitive in terms of uh, museum shows and solo shows and gallery shows, and that was very much an, an East Coast thing. But it definitely is spreading across the country, and there were artists who just thought, "What is happening here? This isn't about the work. It's no longer about the work. It's no longer about how art makes you feel or think or how we relate to each other and to the world and to nature." And so um, Robert Smithson, Smithson was one of the first. He went to um, the Salt Lakes. Hang on one second. 
hold on. Okay, let me make sure. I want to make sure I don't get it wrong. Um, he went out to the uh, 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 Great Lakes and he um, he built this this spiral out of salt base base salt. Is that how you pronounce it, um, Rodney? Bath salt, and it's yeah. It, was like tons and tons of it and he created this jetty and that you could walk on in this spiral and it was meant for people to connect to nature to be in it to really feel a part of the land and it was kind of an odd thing i mean there was no purpose for it except for the, the fact it was it broke all scale you know it 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 is this giant um, sort of anomaly that he created out of um, salt and concrete. And I think he and four other guys created it. And um, over a week um, soon after that happened um, and people were able to walk on it and photograph it, it was submerged by the, by the tide for 30 years. You couldn't see it or you could see it very little. And Robert Smithson's feeling was, that's fine, that's good, that's life, that's nature. And, and that will show you the power of nature. I had the intention to build this thing that pe people could um, have community and connect about and on. And nature took that right out of my hands and he sort of loved that. But 30 years later, it came back because the water levels went down and People began to make these pilgrimages um, and document it and what it was to be part of an artwork and to be. Um, it, so, it, Chrissy, can you tell us what are the what are those years? When when did he complete it? And... Um, he completed it um, 1979. He did it, and it was. Um, it was, I mean, hang on a second. I have to pull up my notes for whatever reason. I don't have my, uh, this. You're not, not in the presenter mode, I think. Am I not? Well, yeah. you're in the mode in which we see your slides, but if you right, have notes. Right. I'm not in presenter mode. mode. So let me just, let me just yeah. call up. I have, I mean, the facts around this are kind of incredible. Um, okay, here. This oh, is I see, I, I, I have your notes. <laughs> Oh, you do? Is that what you can see? Because um, I, I have your presentation, although I got to figure how do I move this thing up? So it says here, um, okay, 1960s, 70s, civil unrest and conflict here and abroad. So that's Vietnam, right? And, um, and uh, these guys who they later became known as land artists or earth artists, they wanted to try to get back to the basics and revive the power of nature. We'd gotten very far away from that. We kind of became destroyers of nature rather than protectors of nature. Um, and so um, different artists, I'll name a few more, Michael Heiser, Richard Long, Alan Sonifus, Agnes Dennis. So if you ever come across these other artists are quite wonderful, but I only chose two um, to teach in, in the Art That Wows class because it, it's its own thing. It could be its own entire class. It's just to make the point that it was the first time, um, you know, people could go see the Mona Lisa and they go, wow, you know, that's amazing. That's the Mona Lisa, but it's a different feeling than when you can actually be immersed in this experience when art becomes an experience right, and experience to share with others because yeah, you know the earlier art was trying to um reflect reality but this is its own reality this is not this exactly. isn't depicting anything this is the thing right and so robert smithman so he saw this pre-columbian serpent um sculpture um out in uh Ohio. It's it's called the Great Columbian Great Serpent Mound in Adams County, Ohio. And it's supposed to be this ancient, ancient, you know, prehistoric thing. And it made him start thinking about uh, why we don't recognize the artifacts of our society or of other societies. Um, anyway, a spiral jetty, two hour drive from Salt Lake. 
its 1,500 foot vortex constructed with more than 6,000 tons of basalt rocks spinning out into Utah's Great Salt Lake. Um, Smithson and two assistants moved seven tons of earth, basalts, boulders into a shape spiraling out into the Great Lakes of Utah. It was submerged for 30 years. Um, and he, he called that the unpredictable and enduring nature of nature. Um, and that was 1979 and it resurfaced in the nineties, I guess. No. Is it visible now? Yes, it is visible now. And, um, there's an NPR story that uh, I can put on the chat um, about spiral jetty reemerging from the Great Lakes. It's a, you know, a short, um, I think it's a podcast. But in any case, it it sort of, and I, I'll, I'll move on to the next, it, it's quite interesting. And, um, oh, well, I was gonna show you, Walter DeMaria, another artist um, who does land art, he put, um, he put these lightning um, rods in a field and people could watch from a certain distance in a specific area and you would watch at night as you would have lightning hit these lightning rods and it would put on a full show and it was sort of talking about like this is art like what is more what is more art than what we can, what we have right in front of us in, in terms of our own uh, nature and our connection to it. And that was very much a wow. It was well written about in terms of being like, can you believe the guts this guy had to create a lightning field? And then to have people come and watch like it was a show. <clears throat> That's still out there. Um, and then one of my favorites actually, Walter DeMaria has a room and in Soho, New York City. And I don't know, Rodney, if you've ever been the Earth Room. No, I'm not. Oh, it's literally a, you walk up this giant flight of steps. And it's a third floor of a un, indistinct building in Soho at 141 Worcester. And it's filled with dirt, just dirt. And it's, the land is tilled and things grow. And there's one person who sits there Wednesday through through Saturday, maybe for three hours and people come and visit. It's been there since like 1978 or something. All these years that that earth has been in that space um, paid for by the Dia Art Foundation to show that there is a little corner of New York that is still pure soil. And yeah. it's sort of an amazing concept. Um, you bring people into nature, even though they're in the, you know, most, the densest part of New York City. But it's just a wonderful, I just find it a... It's in a building? like you. Yeah, you just... it's 141 Worcester, and it has very, very limited time, because, uh, time that you can go. But very worth going if you're in New York City. Um, I, I still adore it. Anyhow. We should move on. I don't have a lot more time, do I? How much more time do I have? Yeah, we have about 15 minutes. Okay. So the next part of uh, of the story of taking art out of the museums and the galleries and decommercializing it um, is Christo and Jean-Claude. Um, they've done a lot. Uh, does does every, anyone here, have they ever been to a Christo um happening did anyone remember um running fence in marin it's me this speak i've been to that uh you know that bin in chicago rodney oh, yeah. Yeah. reminds me about this yeah. we saw the bean we didn't see chris well, i saw bean. i saw the running fence okay who saw yeah. the running fence me peter and kevin what do you think of it what was it like it was pretty amazing that you know this fence was running all over everybody's property and he had to get all permission from all the people and how it went into the sea it was pretty it's tremendous a, actually a phenomenal movie about it um i think it, it it's uh, just an hour and it talks it it shows what it took they had to have 18 public hearings and they had to convince each rancher across marin um and sonoma to give uh, 
permission for the fence to run through the land. And God, I wish I had a photo of that. Yeah, Gail's commenting that that was a big controversy in Marin. Huge yeah. controversy and so interesting. And I'm, like, I'm sorry, I didn't add that. I was just putting the gates as an example of how, you know, Christo, it took uh, 1979 to 2005 for him to get permission to put these, these saffron colored Shinto shrine. I mean, they're inspired by Shinto shrines, but, but, but these gates with this fabric throughout Central Park for 23 miles, he would do, he would create these enormous projects that took so many years to get them, um, to get them approved by, you know, and part of the political process was part of the process of the work to have to get people to agree to allow the fence on the land, to, to discuss it and debate it in the hearings. Um, it, it just was, it, the whole thing, the project would take a life of it of its own. It would take on a life of its own. And um, at one point, if you watch the film, the, the, the um, running fence runs into the water and they had to um, attach it underwater by these chains. I mean, it's a, a huge um, undertaking of just the amount of steel and 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 cloth and and the Christos always raised money on their own. They never had anything sponsored, um, and it uh, they they paid for all of this uh, with the drawings he did of each work. So there are these beautiful drawings of running fence, and um, he sold them, and then. You know, it, it cost millions and millions of dollars for running fence um, to be made, especially in terms of all the time it took for them from 1979 to, um, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, running fence was 1979. And it it was just, um, the whole process of it was very much attached to the land art and the earth art because that was also the process of the concept of it, the creation of it the um, experiencing it together with others. Um, and, and part of this art that wows, like, you know, I made up the corny title, but you don't even have to talk to people next to you when you're, ha you're in the presence of something sort of um, so uh, uh, mind blowing. I should, I don't want to really use that term, but just something so um, involving and completely immersive. It's not about talking about it. It's about just being there in that space and sharing the kind of electricity and excitement that comes around such a monumental work that, you know, it's conceptual as well as, as, well as physical. Well, one question I, I, I like to ask groups when I take them to museums is like, what are you hoping to get out of your museum experience? Yeah. And I let people answer that. And I tell them what I want most is to be surprised. I want to, to experience something or see something that I never expected to see. And that, that to me is like, that's to me what the art of wow is, is you, you have expanded uh, the realm of what I believe is possible. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and to be honest, I mean, maybe because I've studied art and I've been around it for long, it's, it, it's, sort of hard to surprise after a while, you know, and it's a little disappointing that, um, you know, walking through SF MoMA, you know, I know uh, intellectually that what goes into making a, um, a Gerhard Richter painting and how, how different his work is and how kind of incredible that is, but I don't think you walk up to a still painting anymore and just go, I mean, maybe I would love to know if any of you do. And then I would love, I, maybe I've gotten jaded. Um, I love art so much, but there's something about the, the sharing of an experience with others that takes it to another dimension. For That's me. a great question. Can, can a painting, just a regular painting on canvas be, be uh, the art of wow? I, I do feel like the Rauschenberg white painting um, you know, now, of course, it's been around for a long time, but you can still take people to the museum and not everyone's art seen it and, and you still get strong reactions to me. But it also, it also has to do with who you are and what speaks to you. So you may go and see 
um, the lady with the hat, the Matisse at right. and it may blow your mind. It never, I never had feelings about that specific. Uh, well, because it because that was a hundred hundred and fifteen years ago. Right, that's true. So that's the thing. That's the problem. Is the art of wow is is constantly challenging itself, right? Yeah. To you uh, got to do something completely new in in you know sh something that does surprise and maybe even shock people. So Paco, um, we're talking about Anish Kapoor, this Chicago cloud gate, which people call the bean, much to his annoyance. <laughs> um, Anish Kapoor is an interesting figure. He's um, born in India, but claimed British, um, claimed British uh, uh, nationality. What do they call it? Uh, sorry, I'm a little, um, when asked to be in the, um, the the Venice Biennale, um, he had to pick because India would not allow him to have dual citizenship. So he chose to be British and it was sort of a giant controversy. So here he was um, representing, that was really when he got very famous when he represented England in the Venice Biennale. And, you know, people of course didn't like that he was Indian doing that. It was just awful, but he, um, shook up our concept of of art in terms of um for a lot of reasons but we'll choose the uh, cloud gate the bean as an example um does anyone know why it is so beloved in chicago i have to say the, the fact that it's like this perfect mirror and you do like it is kind of perfect for taking selfies of, of sorts that's true it is true. But you're That's actually a vanity, Rodney. Oh, go ahead, Parker, say that again. That's actually a vanity when you take a photo in the mirror, too. That's so true, Paco. And that's the point. Um, Anish Kapoor is, is making you think about um, the vanity and uh, and the, the fact that we we look for reflections of ourselves with Instagram and and you know no nothing about you is personal anymore. It's very much you're very conscious of how you're seen, and that is one of the messages he made with this. Well, I like this image that you're showing us, Drusy, because it almost looks like it's a, it's its own globe or something. You know, yeah. That... You know the interesting thing about this 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 um, specific cloud gate. Chicago, it's become a symbol of Chicago. I mean, it's kind of taken on a, a sort of mythos. Um, uh, you can go under it, you can go around it. It's a place where people will meet, like, oh, let's meet at uh, the Bean at four o'clock. It's very much um, a centerpiece of Chicago now. And um, and there are a lot of people who are very against it. It it there was a lot of controversy. And to be honest, with all of the art that wows, um, there there's been controversy for each piece. Each each if you're gonna put something so large out there, um, large and reflective and contemporary, it it raises some hackles. Yeah, I always think that I always think controversy is often good for art. It, it engages us. I um, want to read a couple of comments. Uh, Karen was um, pointing out that Christo has wonderful drawings and that um, she is wowed because they are so big and glorious. Oh, they are. And then Sarah's pointing out another kind of wow sculpture, which is at the De Rosa um, Center for the Arts in Napa, um, a sculpture that is 65 feet tall, made of filing cabinets. Um, which I believe contains um, uh, the the remains of a of a um, MG car. I have seen that recently too. It's a wonderful. It's it's exciting. It is indeed exciting, Sarah. I agree. Um, we are getting a little short on time, and I know we have a, a kind of exciting video. video we want to. So, I, uh, I had a comment about uh, the wow no, thing. I think, I think if you've ever bought a piece of artwork. You bought it because you thought it was a wow. That is true. Or you should have bought it because it was a wow. Yeah, yeah, because there's a lot of artwork out there. And it's, yeah. It's a matter of whether or whether it speaks to you. But the, the element of a lot of this work is a couple of things. First of all, often it's site specific. So, and, 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 and for instance, with Christo, it's, 
most of the work was up for a week or two weeks at the most before something made it come down, whether it was the weather or the politics, they were allowed to have it, you know, a finite amount of times. So you could only see it then. And then it became the only thing that represented was the drawings that he did. And there's sort of an immediacy about that that makes it a happening. Um, and actually, um, the other thing is that it's a shared experience, right? So impermanence, as well as the fact that you have to be there. Um, uh, Rodney's going to show a video in a minute, but it, it but you, you'll get a sense of of how extraordinary Teen Lab is, but it isn't the same as being in that room and being completely. And people get emotional and they burst into tears and. Um, there's just, it's a whole host of, but I'll just, um, before we do that, I just wanted to, um, does everyone know who um, Yayoi Kusama is? She's a sort of the greatest, people consider the greatest and most unique living contemporary artist, or maybe not living or unliving, but you know, she's 94 and she lives in an insane asylum in Tokyo. Okay, that's, this is also her work, but she does these infinity rooms no, I, oh, sorry. Uh, you know, she does these infinity rooms where you have like 45 seconds. This is me in an infinity room um, at the Broad in LA. Um, you get, you stand in line for two, I stood in line for two hours and you make friends with everyone around you. It's just the most congenial, lovely experience. And, um, and then you go in and you're alone in there and it's all lights, there's water, it's mirrors, there's like, you know, it's sort of, uh, it's supposed to reflect the universe and all of us connecting and sharing. And there's many other things Kusama wants you to feel about it. But the fact that you're in there alone for that amount of time is, it's like an adventure. And then you come out and, you know, I remember sharing with a bunch of people in the cafeteria, having a cup of coffee. I never saw them before or after, but it was sort of that moment. Um, so Kusama is sort of brilliant. Then this is another work she does called Narcissus Garden. And Paco, this is another example of having something reflective, a reflective ball that makes you have to think about your need to to see yourself rep represented and how you're represented, the self-consciousness. So this is um, this is called Narcissus Garden. And she's done many, many of them. This one is um, on an island off of Japan. I actually was there this summer and it's mm -hmm. incredible. It's just tons and tons of these. And it's in the water and it's in the land. And over here is the Rubin Museum of Art in Miami. They did an exhibition of endless amounts of these balls going through the whole museum which is just it's overwhelming and it's fascinating and it kind of makes you giggle you know and and um that's part of it I it seems a little gimmicky too to me but it when you're there it it isn't it feels like you're in a happening you know you're in the mind of a kind of crazy wonderful artist I'm just, just so gold excuse me those what? balls very yeah. gothic, but very beautiful, brilliant. Is, you, you beautiful love and kind of trippy at the same time. Yeah, brilliant. And I, yeah, and the way they reflect the sky and the water, the grass, and then the other side, they're reflecting each other. It's 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 kind of wonderful. She's such an in. She's such she's Kusama's really unique in her concepts are just. Um, never before seen she's a complete original i so, wanted so to we're kind of getting getting okay. short on time so this is james terrell go look him up he's the most incredible if you ever get a chance to go to to see a terrell you cannot appreciate it unless you're in it you have to be in one to get it and there's actually one at the de young i don't know if it's in operation but it's supposed to be it should be the de young sculpture garden there's yep. james terrell all right <laughs> We're now gonna we're going to stop sharing so you can, I just well, got to Unfortunately, Teresa, we're going to kind of need to wrap. Okay. We've, got, we've got another program coming up. Um, Sorry, but, I always do too many. Well, it just gives you a sense of like how great your classes are. Like they're going to be very rich experiences. Is it is it still possible for people to register for your classes? Oh, yeah, absolutely. One is on Ollie at Berkeley and the other is um, the Frome Institute at USF. Well, send me your information on that, Drusy, and I'll put it in my Friday email. Okay, um, great. 
I know it's Sarah's involved, really looking forward also, to the, the Berkeley it's just class. It's involving and, and I don't know, it's just a positive, good thing, you know, which is nice for us to have. Yep. Well, thank you so much, Drusy, for, for coming Absolutely. in and sharing your passion for these two um, these two groups of art. 